Today, we are setting out on a journey. Today, we are beginning together along the road that will take us all the way up to Great and Holy Pascha when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today begins what's known as the Triodion period, which is a period of several weeks that leads us up to the beginning of the Great Fast, that leads us up to the beginning of Great and Holy Lent. And the calendar of the Church wants, in these coming weeks, to ease us into the fast. And so this coming week, there's no fasting whatsoever on the Church's calendar, not even Wednesday and Friday, like there usually is throughout the year. The week after that, there is just the normal Wednesday and Friday fasting, like we have most of the year. The week after that is what's called Meat Fair Week. During that week, we begin our fast because we're not eating meat during that week, but other things are still allowed. And then begins Great and Holy Lent when we begin the fast in earnest. So the Church wants to ease us into the fast. But while getting us ready, preparing our bodies, getting us ready for this new diet that we might be adopting during the fast, the Church also wants to teach us a little bit about what fasting means. And we can't say anything about what fasting means without also talking about what repentance means. Because Lent, more than anything else, is a season of repentance. Lent is a time during which we're called to look at our life, to look at our way of living, And to see those areas where God is calling us to move forward, where God is calling us to change, to put behind our old habits, and to put in their place new habits of prayer, of love for our neighbor. We're called to a life of repentance during Lent. And we tend to think of Lent as being an exceptional time of the year. But uh, I knew a priest, Father Maximus, who liked to say that Lent is not the exception Lent is when we learn how to be Christians. Lent is that time during which if we'll allow God to transform us, then our life can become a little bit more what we're called to be throughout the year. Repentance is not something we begin during Lent and then stop once Lent is over. But repentance is a way of life for us as Christians. We are always called to follow after God, to take up our cross and follow in the way of that God has put before us. And so today we have the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Two men walk into the temple one day. One of them is a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is a person, a sect within Judaism at the time of Christ who were concerned with keeping the law very strictly, with obeying all of the commandments that we read in the Old Testament. Their lives, according to the Jewish law, were spotless. And so this Pharisee walks into the temple, and behind him, into the temple, walks a tax collector. Now the tax collectors were the polar opposite of the Pharisees. You see often in the scriptures that tax collectors are used as the paragon, the absolute, the best example of what it means to be a sinner. And why is this? Because the tax collectors were Jewish people who were representing and collecting taxes on behalf of the Roman occupiers. So they were people who had colluded, who had joined forces with the Romans in oppressing the Jewish people and were collecting taxes on behalf of people that many Jews saw as being the enemy. But not only that, because the tax collectors would collect from the people not only the amount of taxes that they owed, but they would collect more than what was owed in order to line their own pockets. Tax collectors at the time were even less popular than tax collectors are today. 
And so we have walking into the temple a man who, whose life is an example of virtue, who obeyed the law completely, and a man whose life is the absolute opposite of virtue, a man who has sinned in many, many different ways. And the Pharisee stands and he looks up to heaven. And I love the words of scripture here that it says, he prayed thus with himself. In other words, he's really talking to himself here. He's not talking to God, he's talking to himself. And he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. He finds all these examples of different sins that he is not committing. And he thanks God that he's not like that. Or even like this tax collector. And even there in his prayer, he finds a reason to trample on his fellow man, to put down his fellow man. And he boasts, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. He stands before God, and the only thing he can think to do is to praise himself. Speak about how wonderful his own virtues are. Notice the egotism of this man. Everything he's saying, every sentence that he says here, begins with the word I. I thank you that I am not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Everything that he's saying is about himself and all of the wonderful things that he's doing. Meanwhile, the tax collector, standing at the back of the temple, who sees very clearly his own sins, who knows that he's fallen short of the life to which God had called him, can't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but simply says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Notice that shift from I to me. He's now not focusing on all the things that he is doing. He's not even so much focusing on his own sins. He's not beating himself up here. He's not saying, I'm such a terrible person. I do these bad things all the time. I'm a wretched tax collector. Instead, he's focusing on what God can do for him. He's saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, I'm saying the sinner. And our translation today says, a sinner. It uses the word a. And those of you who know me know that whenever I say our translation says that I'm about to correct the translation that we're using today. In Greek it says ilastitimi to amartolo. God be merciful to me, the sinner. Not a sinner, but the sinner. Why? Because if he sees himself as being a sinner, then he's seeing himself as being one among many. One sinner among many. And perhaps he is. He is one sinner among many. But from his perspective, as a man who is only concerned with the grace, the forgiveness that God can offer to him, the sins of the other people around him are of no concern to him whatsoever. His own sins are the only sins that he sees. And so he says, not God be merciful to me, a sinner, but God be merciful to me, the sinner, the one, the one and only from his perspective. We read in the Gospel that the Pharisee, despite all of his virtue, and he was saying all these things about the wonderful things he does, that he fasts twice a week, that he gives tithes, all these things that he does, if, he's probably telling the truth. The Pharisees did all those things. He's probably right that he was following the law with exactness. But he uses his virtue, he uses his piety as a reason to boast, as a reason to put down his brother, as a reason to fall into a greater sin than it would have been for him to fail to fast, to fail to give tithes. He falls instead into pride. And we see so often that pride is really at the root of so many of our sins. 
If we struggle with anger, often it's because in our pride we see ourselves as having been insulted in some way. We see ourselves as not having been given the thing that is due to us. And so we become angry because of our pride. If we struggle with different sexual sins, often it's because in our pride we see ourselves as deserving of some kind of pleasure that maybe we're not getting in other ways. And so pride, we find, is very often at the root of so many of the passions. Pride is at the root of so many of our our failings and our sins. And this teaches us a little bit about repentance. Because, let's let's use an image here, if we were weeding the garden, and we went to a weed that was in the garden, and we pulled that weed out, but we snapped the branch in half, let's say, as we were pulling it out, so that the root was still there in the dirt. What would happen to that weed? Who can tell me? It would grow back, exactly. And you could try to pull that weed out a hundred times and keep snapping it off as you're doing it. And it's going to grow back a hundred times. But if you pull that weed out by the root, you pull it out so that the root comes with it, then it's not going to grow back at all. It's not going to grow back whatsoever. And so as we in our own life are struggling against our sins, as we're struggling in this, in this journey of repentance, let's look at our sins and let's try to find out what is it that's the root of those sins. Very often we'll find that there's, that there's pride, that there's pride deep within our heart that needs to be pulled out if our lives are going to be transformed. This is the pride that the Pharisee falls into. And all of his virtues... All of his piety, all of the good things he was doing, those did not justify him before God. Those things uh, were, were really meaningless in the long run because his pride polluted all of the things that he was doing. But the tax collector, who had no virtues to brag about, who had only, only sins that he could see all too clearly, in his humility, falls down before God and can only say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And this man's prayer was acceptable to God. This man went home justified. And if you look at the icon that we have displayed for today's feast, we see the two men on the left walking into the temple. The Pharisee is above. The publican is below. Neither of them here have halos. And then on the right side of the icon, you see them walking out of the temple, and now the tax collector is on top, Pharisee is down below, and the tax collector now has a halo because his prayer was acceptable to God. He was justified before God in his humility because he had in his life no opportunity for boasting, no opportunity for pride. Why does the church put this parable before us today as we begin this journey of Holy Lent? Because as we are making this journey together, some of us are going to fast in a very rigorous way. Some of us are going to follow exactly the, uh, the regimen that the church puts before us. Some of us are going to follow that fasting regimen a little bit, a little bit less rigorously, according always to our, to our own needs and our own spiritual state. But we could do everything that the church tells us to do. We could fast completely from meat, from dairy, from wine, from olive oil, from all the things that the church tells us to fast from during Lent. We could come to all of the Lenten services that we have here at the church. We could say all of the extra Lenten prayers. We could make large donations, let's say, to charity during Lent. All those things are good. All those things are wonderful things to do. But if we use them as an opportunity to boast, as an opportunity to brag, as an opportunity to puff ourselves up in pride, then our Lenten journey will have been wasted And we will end Lent further away from Christ than we were when we began. Meanwhile, we could 
in our weakness fail to keep the fast, fail to come to church as often as we know that we should, fail to give any kind of extra donations to charities during Lent. We could, we could, we could fail to say any kind of extra Lenten prayers whatsoever. And we could arrive during Holy Week before the cross of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ with only this prayer on our lips, God be merciful to me, the sinner, and then our Lenten journey will not have been in vain. And then we will end Lent closer to Christ than we were when we began. And let's make that our goal this year, to be closer to Christ at the end of Lent than we were when Lent started. Let's do what we can, of course, to keep the fast. Let's do what we can to come to church, to pray, to offer from our resources to charity. But let us recognize that Lent, before any of that, is a time for us to repent. And unless we recognize our own shortfalls, unless we recognize our own failings, Unless we recognize the areas in which we need to grow, then repentance is impossible. The church puts before us today the parable of the publican and the Pharisee to show us that repentance is absolutely incompatible with a spirit of pride and of boasting. And so today, like that tax collector, Recognizing our own sins, recognizing our own need for the grace and the mercy that God gives so abundantly. Let us fall down before him and pray to him that prayer of repentance. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And then, when we arrive at the feast of the resurrection of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, when we arrive at the feast of great and Holy Pascha, like the tax collector, we will arrive as men and women who are justified before God. Amen.